afternoon and thanks for joining us. I'm Judy Simpson. When it comes to Vermont's water quality, one of the concerns is phosphorus, and one of the places to find phosphorus is in manure. Vermont bans the spread of manure from December 15th to April 1st, but throughout the year, UVM Extension is working on solutions to help improve water quality. Rebecca Gollin tells us about one example in Franklin County using state-of-the-art technology. For farmers, Growing season in Vermont means hard work, long hours, and lots of dirt. For their neighbors, it can mean dealing with the pungent smell of manure being spread. It's not a waste, it's a fertilizer. Spreading manure on the field before planting is a farming technique that has been used for centuries. While it can leave a powerful impression, it's liquid gold for farmers, bringing essential nutrients to soil and helping produce better crops. In the past, some farms would, you know, go out and apply their manure. What they had, they distributed it to the fields, and that's the way that we've done manure application in Vermont and really across the country for a very, very long time. That essentially University of Vermont Extension agronomist Heather Darby says that while that worked in the past, these days there are other considerations that have to be made. That includes both the quality and yield of the crops, as well as the water quality of Lake Champlain. St. Albans Bay watershed has been targeted through the EPA to essentially have significant reductions in phosphorus loading, and we have to figure out how to meet those reductions. Darby and her team recently received a $75,000 grant from the Agency of Natural Resources through their ecosystem restoration program. The grant is aimed at bringing precision agriculture to manure management. That means using a variety of equipment and software to measure exactly how much manure is being spread and where. The project will use Global Positioning System, or GPS, and Geographic Information System, or GIS, to help detect the fluctuating nutrient needs within individual farm fields, and then enable manure spreaders to adjust application rates as needed. The project's focused in the Jewett Brook watershed, which is a watershed that has been identified as being impaired from nutrient and sediment runoff, some of that coming from agriculture. So the goal is to really go into this very small defined sub-watershed and work with the farmers there, evaluate their nutrient management plans, look at where buffers should be, what the rates of manure application are, um, and essentially translate those into what, what's called prescriptions. The group will be testing these precision technology tools on two types of spreaders in Franklin County over the next couple of years. Scott Magnan does custom crop service and manure application out of his shop in St. Albans. He helps clients figure out how to make a nutrient management plan to implement their prescription. He does that using a piece of technology that will make some farm neighbors cheer. It's a manure injector, and it buries its bounty beneath a layer of dirt, directing it to where the nutrients are needed the most, and more importantly, no odor. Some people just hire us because of the odor, just if they're in a village and they wanna have a good relationship with their neighbors. Magnin and Darby are helping area farmers integrate these new techniques, which will give the farmers greater flexibility over traditional broadcast spreading. So we installed a display inside the cab where the operator can select the job he's doing, what piece of equipment he's doing, and the target rate in a prescription if it has one. The new technology also helps whoever is doing the spreading ensure that their load ends up in the right place. You know, most nutrient management plans today um, are, are very paper-based, and so, you know, generally a custom applicator would have like a, you know, clipboard full of maps that kind of shows them where the buffers are and where, you know, what the manure application rate should be and how many times a year sh they should be applying manure. Darby hopes the end results will inform farmers about a safer and more efficient way to manage nutrients, while helping them track exactly what is going on and in to their soil.
At the end of the day, you know, this technology also records the rate of manure applications that are put on the fields. It gives the farmers a nice sort of recording of what actually happened. It helps the custom applicator really track what's going on, and it does it automatically, you know, through the program. Helping farmers learn new ways to keep their nutrients on the farm and out of Lake Champlain. In St. Albans, I'm Rebecca Gollin with Across the Fence. Thank you, Rebecca. Our next segment looks at agricultural research of a different sort. In the wake of Tropical Storm Irene in 2011, farmers began asking Extension whether there was a commercial crop that could grow well in floodplains. Those inquiries led to a research project looking into the feasibility of growing elderberries. Keith Silva has that story. You may have heard of elderberries being used in jams, jellies, or wine. If you were raised on 70s British comedy, you'll recall the word elderberries being used as a taunt in a Monty Python movie. Your mother was a hamster and your father smelt of elderberries. Elderberries are a little bit smaller than a pea. They grow on bushes and are harvested by cutting them off in bunches like grapes. They're a native plant, so they're really well adapted to this climate. At the farm between in Cambridge, John Hayden thinks an elderberry bush is the perfect plant for Vermonters to have at home. What we like about them is they'll grow well in marginal soils, so some of the heavier soils where other fruit won't thrive. So they have a nice little niche there. So that's, uh, we're, we're using them to plug into areas where we couldn't really grow other fruit. There's a lot of talk about them. They're, people are joking, it's like the next big thing. Go east on Route 15 and you'll find Elmore Roots, where owner David Freed loves so elderberries so much, oh. he's written a rap. It's our elder, our ancestor, our wise old shrub. Keeps us on our feet, brings us home from the pub. When he's not rapping about elderberries, Freed encourages customers to grow their own. They're not very fussy. The best thing is you start with a good sized plant with a good root system, plant it, not very deep, and keep putting compost and other rich earth from your garden around the base. Then they grow by themselves. We don't do very much, we just let them grow. Fried and Hayden's interest in elderberry isn't new. People have been cultivating elderberries to use as medicine for centuries. It's said elderberry syrup was the go-to elixir for old-time Vermonters who wanted to ward off winter colds and flus. At Rail Yard Apothecary and Yoga Studio in Burlington, herbalist Guido Mazze prescribes elderberry as a way to fight the common cold. As a clinical practitioner in herbal medicine, I've recommended elderberry countless times, and you have a couple of outcomes. Either the person just does not get sick when they're taking elderberry consistently, and I usually recommend it for folks who complain of getting sick, you know, three, four times every winter. They start taking elderberry consistently, and they find that um, that goes down substantially, and sometimes they don't get sick at all. So there's that. The medicinal properties of elderberries and its hardiness in Vermont's climate got researchers at University of Vermont to wonder if it was possible to grow elderberries on a commercial scale. Ginger, where are we? We are in the Intervale farm. And Ginger Nickerson works for University of Vermont Extension's John Center Hayden for Sustainable Hayden. Agriculture. This project was funded by the Working Lands Enterprise Initiative. We created these three different scenarios, a 40 bush planting, a one acre planting, and a five acre planting and um, looked at what the markets and prices would be for all of those different scales. And then we also created um, an elderberry decision tool, which is an online spreadsheet where you can go and you can plug in all of your own numbers for the enterprise that you wanna create and see whether that would be profitable for you. The market for elderberry products is still developing and so commercial production is still a ways away. To increase the popularity of the fruit and get ahead of the curve, Nickerson suggests starting small. To start a commercial elderberry business, there's gonna be a lot of upfront capital investment. And because that's not gonna be for everybody, but the plant is still really great, we're recommending that people who are interested in it, but who might not wanna make those big capital investments, they should still grow it, just growing it at a smaller scale. 
What's not to love about a plant that's purple and green, royal colors, and that gets rid of the virus in the common cold? Todd Hardy owns Thornhill Farm in Greensboro. His farming experience includes making honey. He learned about elderberries from longtime Vermonters and his friends, Lewis and Nancy Hill. Lewis was a very kind man. He told me about the elderberries for 14 years, and I didn't hear him until I started seeing elderberry products come in from Europe made with white sugar. Mm. And I realized that we could do something made in Vermont with raw honey. And that changed our work with Honey Gardens Apiaries. The hills developed two varieties, or cultivars, of elderberries, which are unique to Vermont, Coomer and Berry Hill. For Hardy, growing elderberries is a tribute to his friends. Lewis and Nancy Hill are gentle giants of Vermont horticulture. Their books are in most every library. They wrote about daylilies, elderberries, black currants, flowering plants, and they were dedicated to Vermont, to Greensboro, and to horticulture. And Lewis knew how important the elderberries were, and he kept telling me about them. And it was a great way to diversify from being commercial beekeepers. And by mixing elderberries with the raw honey, the gift that Lewis gave us, we were able to stabilize our farm and um, make a really wonderful plant medicine. Elderberries are well suited for value-added products. At the farm between, John Hayden makes an elderberry, ginger, and honey syrup. The syrups retail for $15 for a 12-ounce bottle. It's a beautiful plant, so first of all, so if you're just in it for the aesthetics, it's beautiful to look at when it's in flower. You get these beautiful white uh, panicles of flowers that fill the bush. It smells great. Um, it's very diverse in terms of uh, you can use the flowers to make fritters or make syrups or cordials, flavor jellies, put in your hard cider. I mean, you can do all kinds of stuff with the flowers. It takes three to five years for an elderberry bush to bear fruit. Five pounds of berries makes about two and a half quarts of juice. As for care, Hayden's advice is keep it simple. They do well with the what we call the stun method, which is sheer, total, utter neglect. So you can, if you have a black thumb, you should be able to put these in the ground and make sure they get watered in the first few weeks and uh, they're gonna take off from there. It's a little weed management around the base so they're not competing with grasses and stuff when they're young. They're gonna, they're gonna thrive. They're native to this place, so uh, they know how to grow here. Freed finds the elderberry to be stunning as well and the perfect complement for a diverse landscape. The most important thing is you plant a couple of varieties, two or three cultivars, and you don't baby them too much. Sometimes we just take them out of the pot, set them on the ground, put a stake in them so you can tell that they're there, let them grow on top of the ground. The bigger the plant you plant, the faster you're gonna have elderberries. Uh, you wanna give them a little space between them because they get big. See how big this bush is? So this bush has been here for a long time and it's growing underneath apple trees and it's not a problem. It likes to be, have friends around. Multi-purpose, usefulness, a very useful plant. As an herbalist, Mazze has heard all the skepticism about folk remedies and natural medicines. For him, growing a stand of elderberries is like putting a medicine cabinet in your backyard. People have looked at these um, botanicals and particularly elderberry has a lot of good research behind it and have consistently seen not only that it helps in people when they're feeling sick, but that there's reasons why. When you look at what the pharmacology is, um, the immune system's action is bumped up, innate immunity is more active, and um, you also see a reduction in the ability of viruses to replicate. So there's a clinical evidence and a pharmacological evidence basis for these plants. And honestly, it doesn't mean that you can't take some aspirin when your fever hurts. Take both together and what you'll find is that your technological, modern technological medicine will help in the moment to reduce symptoms, but that herbal medicine will really help make you stronger, more well, and more vibrant in the long run. It's no joke. In sickness and in health, elderberries have had a lasting influence on people's well-being. 
when it comes to this kind of advice, it's always good to listen to your elders. In Burlington, I'm Keith Silva with Across the Fence. For more information about the Elderberry Project, visit the web address on your screen. The site provides access to the Financial Decision Support Tool and a guide for propagating elderberries in your own backyard. That's all the time we have for today. Thanks for joining us. I'm Judy Simpson. I'll see you again next time on Across the Fence.